I want to talk about the hemp russet mite. I think okay. it's another one that uh, I've been seeing a lot of with people. Um, it's pretty easy to identify, I think, relative to other other issues and other mites, but can you talk a little bit about it in general? Well, um, yes and no, because again, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, I do think there's a lot of bad information. Um, they do not live in the vascular tissue of the plants. They're not inserting their eggs into the vascular tissue. Um, you know, the, again, it's, it's, um, it's important to be getting good information, but the problem is, is people, the first thing they do is they go to the internet. And unfortunately, there's, uh, you know, a lot of bad information on every subject out there. Um, I think those are some of the biggest misconceptions. Um, how do you get it? You generally have done it to yourself because you brought it in on plant material or possibly your clothing. Um, I've been in enough cannabis facilities that, you know, as you're walking down the aisle, your shoulders are brushing up against uh, the cannabis plants and you're just acting as a giant vector spreading. Um, the, in, the, the mites or even insects down the rows and you know you want to be able to walk through a facility without dragging your shoulders because even even if you put on a lab coat or a Tyvek suit or anything then you go out to the lobby you take it off you still could have insects on your skin and you know I, you need to be wearing a hairnet you know but still you can spread things around that way and and basically the hemp russet mite is a completely self-induced problem because of poor sanitation in the cannabis industry nuts so we're not getting hemp russet from the outdoors it's coming plant to plant transmission well if you are next door to a hemp field that has it it could theoretically blow in but you know back to this whole the government's releasing it out of the back of vans driving down the roads you know that is just it's all conspiracy series so conspiracy theory stuff and that the the other area fiads um they're using for weed management. It's not even close to the same species. So that's not, it's, it's, nobody wants to take responsibility that they've done it to themselves, but that's exactly what's happened with the cannabis aphid because the cannabis aphid is now all been down the Eastern seaboard. Hmm, how'd it get here? Through plant movement. It didn't fly over here from California. It didn't ride over on grapes. It didn't ride over on strawberries. It came on cannabis plant material. And it's the same thing with a hemp russet mite, poor sanitation practices. I would say that when I'm consulting, we probably spend 70, 75% of our time dealing with just sanitation in production facilities these days. So what are some good identifying characteristics of hemp russet? Um, when you see it again, you need super high magnification. It's basically shaped like a carrot, um, where the broad mites are much more like jelly bean kind of shaped. These are more shaped like a carrot. So that's one of the easiest ways to, to see it. Um, and they're kind of creamy colored. Does it have multiple stages of, of growth? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's just like like spider mites and just like broad mites. You know, when they first hatch out, they're real tiny, and each time they molt, they just get a little bigger. Um, but again, you know, if you see a carrot with a couple hairs at the front end, that's their legs. I mean, it, it, it's just no mistaking it in, in cannabis. That's the only thing that looks like that so far that we've seen in cannabis. With all this hemp going in outside, who knows what we're going to see? Because we're starting to see all kinds of new pests in the outdoor hemp production. And that may end up eventually in some of the indoor grows. Um, but for right now, again, July 11th, 2019, if you see something looks like a carrot, it's pretty much going to be a hemp russet mite. Unless it's a lot bigger and is a ladybug larva. Oh, a lot bigger and looks completely different. Hey, I've seen that confused. So. Oh, um, I know. I've had thrips and russet mites confused and yeah. So with the hemp russet, uh, what sort of treatment options do we have uh, once, we've, once we've spotted it? Yeah. Well, first of all, again, smack yourself in the back of the head for bringing it in. Okay. Um, and then after you do that, um, there's not a lot. Um, with, you know, and we've talked about this briefly before and some of the stuff. I had higher hopes, I think, for a lot of the predatory mites. I do not have a lot of confidence in the predatory mites to manage it at this point. Um, I think that Andersoni as a prevention still has some something there. But once you have a population, again, spraying soaps or oils, I think are your best options. And you've got to get really, really good spray coverage. 
I mean, that's what it comes down to is good spray technique with good equipment, not paint sprayers. Spray equipment designed for applying pesticides. Will the Seth Oil X work as well? Yes, for, for it, it works amazing. Um, again, there's been some work going on and somebody else is doing it. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm going to wait for him to put all that stuff out. But the Seth Oil did really well in his trials on the hemp russet mite. Extremely well. Now, I know some of these have a life cycle of a certain number of days or weeks. Uh, how many applications or sprays do we need to be doing to really control any of these insects we're talking well, about? Well, it, it's all time. about spray coverage, and that's the thing. And also with the eggs. So eggs, oils kill eggs better than soaps do, um, typically. You know, there's always exceptions, but for the most part. But with eggs, since they respirate so low, when you spray oil on it, they just to suffocate. But if you have a very low respiration rate, it's hard to suffocate them. But uh, I know Cornell's done a lot of work on um, Dan Gilran looking at oils and using them uh, for two-spot spider mites eggs. And he said it works extremely well. The hemp russet mite eggs are so small and transvaporate, and not transvaporate, and they're respirating very low, so they need multiple applications of oil. So you've got to look at your temperatures. You've got to look at, if your plant's stressed, you got to be really careful. Also, you know, sulfur and oil, bad, 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 bad idea. Um, I'm not a fan of using sulfur. If sulfur will, um, if used properly, you can really knock back um, hemp russet mites. I'm concerned about all the sulfur being used because of resistance issues potentially. And also you've kind of excluded yourself from using beneficials at this point. Um, and also um, I had one of my growers who uh, was using sulfur and they tested positive for arsenic and they went and they tested the sulfur and that seemed to be the source of arsenic was in the sulfur product they were spraying. Oh geez. So yeah. Well, again, remember, if it's being used in on tomatoes and things like that, they're not heavy metal accumulators, so no one's ever had to worry about testing that stuff before. And I'm not saying, you know, that all sulfur has arsenic. Don't, you know, in this particular situation, this is was, was their source. So, so I'm just, I'm not going to say I would never recommend it, but I generally don't recommend it. And I think you're a lot safer for resistance issues because it's going to be really hard to build resistance to oils. Um, Cost-wise, stuff oil X. I think about two and a half gallon jug is like sixty bucks, and if you mix it up at like a one percent, so you're going to make two hundred and fifty gallons of solution for sixty dollars. I mean, yeah. the price is there. It's Omri listed, so it's approved for use in organic production. I'm not saying you can't use other oils. It's just I've worked with this oil for like twenty five years, so I have a good comfort with it. I mean, that's, the, you know, basically what it is. I, I haven't had Fido. Once it's dry, we can re-release the beneficials. But you probably are going to have to do a few sprays back to back because you have to get really good spray coverage. And even though you think you get 100% spray coverage, you're not. And that's why if you do it again, you know, um, you're going to get more coverage. It's just like, you know, you paint a wall a different color and you think you got it. And the next day and you go by, you see spots that are really thin where the paint wasn't thick enough. And that's why going back and putting a second coat on will make sure. Are, are you talking like the next day or waiting? No, I'd give it a couple days in between because you don't want to just coat your plants in oil either. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about bringing a plant into the facility? Let's say you had a plant that you're bringing in. You're like, well, it could have hemp russet mite or it could have any of the other pests we talked about. What would be your sort of procedure for treating, you know, dunking clones or, or cleaning up whatever it is you're bringing in? Well, oh, you need to have a quarantine area. And this is the problem. I'm even seeing new facilities being built that don't have quarantine areas. They just, the, 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 the growing areas aren't isolated enough. So problems just get spread around. Um, with, dipping of plants. Now you never, any kind of oil product you do not want to dip um, the roots in. Um, you know, the oils are better for uh, the foliage. Sorry, my cat's just jumping up. Hey, Blumpers. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> he coming for his afternoon pets. Um, uh, you never want to dip roots in oils and you never want to drench with oils. Um, you can, uh, um, you can, use products like the microbials are safe for roots, the Bavarias, the um, 
as areas and things like that. But remember, those really don't treat for mites, especially hemp russet mite. Up in Canada, they've done a lot of research with dipping cuttings for mums and for poinsettias and things like that. And in their research in Canada, they found that um, dipping in a 0.1% oil solution of foliage, not the roots, was a very good dip rate um, for dipping these plants. And that way you do get 100% coverage. And that's why when people often take cuttings are doing this. It's still, and I mean, this has been going on for years. There's still this, they're trying to get it actually on the label to say that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's technically not on the label yet, but it's, the research shows it works very well for a lot of key pests and it has a very good level of plant safety and you get 100% coverage because a lot of people are like, well, we can just stick them and spray them, but then you're not necessarily going to get 100% spray coverage. So it's it's kind of a, a tricky situation there, and we're waiting for this official dip label. Um, but cannabis isn't on the label either. Yeah, so, so be, because of the laws with the EPA and things around pesticides, you can't recommend uh, a dip rate. Uh, you can talk about the research that exists yes. in Canada, but you can't make that recommendation because of the rules and regulations around, and, and Suff Oil X can't make that recommendation either. Correct use so i just want to clarify that. yeah that's why there's all this dancing <laughs> around yeah. about it but according to research a very good dip rate is 0.1 percent for suffo and people ask me about dip rates for other products and that's you've got to this is what's good about the suffo product is they've got research to back the stuff up it's been trialed it's been tested and you know i see a lot of claims from products and Okay, you make this claim. You say your product annihilates hemp russet mite. Where's a single trial? You know, it annihilates spider mites. Okay, that's something a university could have done or a third party or something. Where is any any research on it? And and it's just not there. And and it, and it's tough to know what to believe and what not to believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I. I know I said that was the last one. I think I have one more. <laughs> That's pretty. This is good. blimpers. I have blimpers. So. I have I have an easy one for you. I think um, just in the sense that I think I know what you're already going to say because we've talked about it. But uh, plant parasitic nematodes, like the root knot nematode. Um, yeah. What what options do we have there? None. With that one. None. None. Flame flowers, burn them. This is my same thing again. Don't get them. I mean, that's, again, they're not flying in. They're not walking in. You brought them into your facility. Now, if you are in the South, because the Southeast United States has a lot of root knot nematode and you're growing your plants outdoors in the ground. Well, that's not your fault. But when you get it in an indoor grow or in raised beds, you brought it in. Um, I had somebody recently contact me and they literally went outside and they just were scooping up soil outside to inoculate indoors. And it, it's a total crapshoot. You could bring in some good stuff. You can bring in a lot of bad stuff too. And that's, that's the, the risk you take with doing things like that. Um, now, the University of Florida um, is putting in 12 hemp trial sites this year down obviously in Florida, under various soil conditions. And it's going to be very interesting to see. And they actually do have one of their nematologists working with them on this to see, you know, what nematodes are picked up and what becomes a problem um, uh, uh, for them. But they've got this really weird uh, situation where they're not going to be able to publish their findings <laughs> because of it being him. So, um, yeah, it's kind of weird. They're not allowed to talk about any of the work they're doing at this point. But okay. that, so, I'm hoping, will give us more information on, um, sorry, blimps, um, on, you know, what, because we don't even know all the nematodes that uh, cannabis can get at this point. Um, I keep getting reports of stem nematodes, which I did have a grower that had some samples, and I was so excited because uh, one of the nematologists agreed to look at them to identify them and everything, and then I asked the grower to ship them, and then the grower just like went dark and wouldn't respond to my phone calls or anything. I called over and over and over again, I guess. They 
you know, decided they didn't want to be involved with that, which I can kind of understand. But at the same time, you know, until we can figure out what we're really dealing with, you know, it's going to be harder to manage the pests. I could probably get you some root knot nematodes. No, these were stem nematodes. Okay. You're not looking for root knot. No, I, we got plenty root knots around. Okay. Um, I haven't seen that one, but, uh, one quite a couple questions I did have around the root knot nematode. So just for people who are less familiar with it, I want to mention that when I've seen it, the plant just literally just seems to stop growing. And then yep. you, when you pull up the plant, you get these galls or knots in the roots themselves. They look almost look like rhizomes that you would see. On, yeah. Uh, you know, on well, like a, root roots on the knot. I mean, not knotted roots, root knot nematode. And it, again, it's not, it's not cannabis specific. You know, it's a big problem on tomatoes. It's a problem. Um, I think carrots get them. There's several vegetables. And that's why, you know, people sell methyl bromide soils uh, to kill these plant parasitic nematodes because they are so, so hard to kill. And that's why in states, again, like Florida, if you're going to ship outside of the state uh, containerized plant material, you have to grow up on tables off the ground to prevent nematodes from getting splashed into your pot. So that's where there's an actual measured height that they grow at because water splashing can spread plant parasitic nematodes. Now, one thing that uh, my friend tried was uh, heating the room for an indoor facility to raise the temperature of the room. They held it at 130 degrees for an hour. I've heard the research says you have to get up to 170, but if you're able to maintain the room at a higher temperature for a period of time like that, I know thermophilic compost that kills off a lot of the pathogenic bacteria. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, what, is that your air temperature or is that the temperature in the middle of your soil bed? Well, in this case, I'm sure it was air temperature, but. Yeah, and so you know it's not even be close to that inside of the soil in there. So it's not, and people ask me about heating room, I, it just, I don't think it's going to work. Don't okay. bring the root knot nematodes in. If you're getting compost, I think you should test your compost for plant parasitic nematodes. You know, this is something that, you know, most universities or in the States, you know, you can just send a little baggie in and have them do a test um, because to me, it's not worth the risk. Yeah. Now, one, one speculation they had too. So they, they have, my, my friend has a space that does have the root knot nematode or it did have it. They tried cleaning the room. They tried all these different products. Um, they were never able to remove it. But what they have been able to do is sort of knock the population down right. to where they can make it two to three cycles before it gets really bad again, sort of thing. So um, they've had a little bit of success and they, they do bring in quite a bit of uh, the Steiner name Feltier, which I probably didn't pronounce correctly. No, you got, you're good. You're good. Close enough. Um, and they were, was there any chance that those two could be competing for some sort of ecological niche in the soil at all? Or are they just two totally? Well, and this is where people have taken liberty saying that the beneficial nematodes will control plant parasitic nematodes. I talked to the woman that actually did some of this work, and this was at like a nematology meeting like 15 years ago. And she said what they found is in the Petri dish, if you put, and I can't remember which beneficial nematode they put in there, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was root knot, is they just kind of slightly moved apart in the dish. Remember, nematodes don't travel far. They're so tiny. And people took that as well. It controls it. Um, it again, if it, if it worked, you would see all the big farms doing it. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't be still using methyl bromide. I mean, that's all I can say is if something works, people do it, and you don't see big farms doing it. Believe me, BASF, they would love to be selling nematodes for control of plant parasitic nematodes because they'd be selling billions of them. If that worked, they'd be doing it. Okay. Um, cool. Well, I, I would love to follow up another time and talk a little bit. We didn't even get to like spider mites or thrips or some of those. Well, other you know, ones. we can't cover that much in a. I know. I know. But that was great. I really appreciate it. That was fun.